Uh, I already got feedback about the audio and the video, and that's why I have my own microphone now. <laughs> was there a video? I didn't even know there was video. Hey, I didn't see you there. This episode might contain some pretty strong opinions about IDEs, and most importantly, it's going to talk about React Native. Hopefully, you can stomach it. As always, I'm looking forward to your feedback. Hope you enjoy it. Today I'm joined by Radek uh, Petrushevsky. Let me know yeah, if I'm butchering right. your name. Like I'm. No, I, that's uh, really close. That's really good. Okay, those East European roots never, mm -hmm. never failed me. Um, yeah, so Radek, you work on the on this pretty interesting app called Nosbe. And uh, mm -hmm. for those who doesn't know, who's not familiar with this app, it is a to do app. What are what are the core differences between, let's say, reminders and mm -hmm. Nosbe? Right now, we have two products, Nosby Personal, and a new thing which I want to talk about, which is called Nosby Teams. Perhaps the closest competitor uh, would be something like Todoist or the old Wunderlist. It's based on GTD, getting things done, kind of philosophy of organizing your own work. It's been built as a personal tool, but as an advanced tool. So, you know, unlike reminders, there's like advanced tagging and filtering and sorting and all sorts of stuff. Uh, and it's also cross-platform with all its, you know, upsides and downsides. Um, over the years, we started adding sharing. So once you start sharing, then you start really caring about the fact that the app is on other platforms. Nosby Teams is like a to-do app for teams. It's a tool to help small teams, um, remote teams especially, get organized, collaborate asynchronously. So Nosby, the company is, you know, it's a tiny company. Uh, we don't have an office. We're completely remote, always have been, not just starting in 2020. To build Nosby at Nosby, we mostly use Nosby. The closest competitors would be like Basecamp or Asana, but they're just completely different in their philosophy, like in how they're built, just different way of thinking about the problem. And really, mostly our biggest competitor is not using a tool like that at all. So communicating over Slack, you know, interrupting each other. With Nosby, you have projects and tasks, but also discussions to, you know, collaborate asynchronously in tasks. That's kind of the idea for the product. So to set the stage, uh, let's maybe talk a bit about the size of your team. The whole company is like 25 people. Out of which something like ten people. I I, nev I can never remember the exact number. Is what I would call the development team, um, but the team that builds the app itself, the front end app, four people. Is there such a thing as iOS team or macOS team? No, uh, there is no such a thing as an iOS team. We have the team making the app, um, and we have um, platform experts. So um, there would be me on iOS, and there would be an uh, Android guy and a web guy. Um, yeah, and in the future, we want to um, support Windows and Mac OS, uh, like we do with Nosby Personal. And for that, we'll also need some more expertise with um, Windows. What is the overlap between uh, the product that you're building and kind of Apple stack of technologies? The way I would describe um, our approach to this app is that it's unapologetically cross-platform. Um, and here's what I mean by that. Um, all the design is mobile first and the mobile app can do everything. There's usually this distinction that there is a, a serious D desktop app or sometimes it's a web app like with Slack, which the app is the web app. And then there's the mobile app, which is like a companion app. We've seen and decided and heard from our customers that they don't want a mini version of the app. They want to be able to do everything on the phone. Consistency within our product is more important than consistency within the platform. The app is absolutely um, tweaked for every platform to feel and look good, to take advantage of native capabilities that are unique to the platform, but overall, Every feature is everywhere and everything is laid out and looks roughly the same because it shares m the vast majority of its code and it's built by one team. I'm kind of curious if you know what, what is the percentage of your customers that uses the app on multiple platforms? Most users uh, don't just use it in front of a computer, but also check in on their phones, um, whether it's iOS or, or Android. Judo app is 
you know, this kind of classic poster child example of like yeah. when, whenever you start a new architecture or like MVC, MVVM, uh, mm-hmm. Redux, whatever, like let's build it to do app. Can you talk a bit more about what is the high level architecture of, uh, of Nosby? Nosby Teams is, um, oh, and I'm afraid you're, you're going to lose like half of your listeners with, with this sentence. It's a React Native app. Please take a deep breath. It is a React Native app. Like most people who are not familiar with React or React Native, when they hear React Native, they think that it's the same as React, that you can use the one code base and target it both for, you know, for iOS, Android, and the web, but that's not true at all. Um, the difference is very similar to the difference between um, AppKit and UIKit. Um, so the the general ideas are the same. Some of the frameworks are the same. Uh, some of the code you can share, but the details are like completely different. So we we base on both React on the web and React Native, but we've invested a lot of time into building our own um, set of tools and, and frameworks and open source libraries, which um, bridge the gap between the two in such a way that. Uh, we get the vast majority of the benefit that we can, you know, share most of the code between mobile and the web, but without most of the downsides like um, loss of performance or loss of um, control over what's happening um, exactly. So it is a React app. So most of the app is in the uh, in the hierarchy of components. It is a bit different from building views and view controllers and there's a view controller hierarchy and a view hierarchy and they're kind of connected but also conceptually different um in react you just have a react component hierarchy and react components can be like a view or it can act like a view controller in ios sense in that it only composes views adds actions to it have all of the logic we have a set of kind of leaf um, components, the leaves of the uh, of the nodes of this whole tree, which act like views. So generic things like list, scrollable, um, button touchable, so something you can tap or or click, um, and those abstractions are there since we target three platforms with one code base, um, and then that can gets composed into um, higher level things like a task. Um, a task view or a task component, and then a task list, and then a whole view of tasks like a priority list or a project list. And then all the way at the bottom, there's the root component, and really it's a few components, um, like it's a whole mini hierarchy, but essentially there's a root of this whole hierarchy, which kind of serves the purpose of like a root view controller and some of the responsibilities of like an iOS app delegate. Um, So it orchestrates the whole show. It decides what gets displayed. It hooks up all the native integrations, um, navigation, routing. Okay, so let's assume that we already lost everyone and that no one is listening. So now we can actually geek out on on the component. Yeah, now we can talk about cool stuff. One way to kind of make it more approachable, let's pretend that we want to build a new screen, right? doesn't matter what, yeah. it, what exactly is the functionality. In the traditional MVC world, I would uh, maybe create a new storyboard entry, maybe create a new view controller, find a um, place where this screen is supposed to be kicked off from. So let's say I tap a button and the screen is being presented. And mm-hmm. so that's where I would put my code to integrate, you know, to like instantiate the view controller and present it. Um, mm-hmm. Can you walk me through the same task in the React native world? With the caveat that it's the world of our app, which is not necessarily exactly the case for 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 all React Native or, or React apps. A couple of things to talk about here. First of all, styling. Generally, there is no such thing as you know like storyboards or designing screens with GUI. I would say it's because it's completely unnecessary. In the same way, why in Swift UI it's completely unnecessary. All the layout and all the styling is done in code. And it, it is done by hand without the magic that the Swift UI has. But the key thing is that you don't need to recompile the app. The worst case scenario, if I'm just building a new screen or a new piece of UI, but I'm not touching any Swift code, just 
in the cross-platform um, part of the app, which is most of the app. The worst case scenario is that the entire JavaScript bundle of the app has to reload um, in the simulator, which is you know way slower than on the actual device. And that takes maybe one second. So I can really quickly, easily, you know, play around with styles, with with layout, etc. That's the worst case scenario. The best case scenario is we have this thing called React Refresh. So just the part that's changed is inserted into the bundle, and just this component is re-rendered, and it's essentially instant. And with our app in particular, um, it wouldn't be uncommon to have the iOS simulator, the Android emulator, and on the second screen, um, you know, your Safari or Chrome, and write the shared styling code and just have it see refreshed on all three platforms at the same time and then you know tweak uh, tweak those styles for all these three platforms as necessary. We also have um, palettes, so there's certain values like sizes or font sizes or colors that are predefined, they're named, but they're different for each platform, right? So you write it once, but it appears differently to suit the platform. Another thing that's important as for building a new screen is routing. So the whole navigation is built around routing. If I'm pushing a new screen or just changing the, the hierarchy, I don't specify that I want to push something or pop something. I just ask the app to navigate to a route. Routes can be serialized to a URL. And then from this URL, the app can deserialize it into what structure of components should be there. You know, native reality of pushing or popping the screens is abstracted away. I'm, I'm just worried about um, the structure of components and that the fact that those components really map into UI view controllers is um, a different layer of, of abstraction. So to answer your question, if I'm adding a new screen, first I'll, I'll add a new route. But I'll, I'll say a few more things about, about routing uh, because I, I'm kind of surprised that it's still not like the default for all mobile developers. It makes so many things so much easier. If you want to rework how your navigation works or looks like, you just worry about the abstraction layers that is routing, not every view controller that will be manipulating other view controllers. Uh, state restoration is trivially easy because state restoration is based on the route primarily. This also means that tweaking the app, making changes to, to the app is much more convenient because for most mobile apps and most mobile app developers, if you make some change and have to recompile the app, or even in React Native, reload the app, you're back to the first screen. You have to navigate there. It's such a waste of time. Um, if you if you have routing, you have state restoration pretty much for free, and then you're back where you are. So you can tweak and iterate so much faster. iOS-specific features, like handing off from one device to another, remembering where you are so you can ask Siri to remind you to go back to this place in this app later, integration with Spotlight without your custom, um, you know, custom adding and removing of, of places in the app. You get all of that for free if you build your app around routing. We talked with, uh, with Ryan, he kind of mentioned that they have a similar idea in, in GitHub. And I really like the way he described it, that you know when your one view controller knows how to create another view controller, all of a sudden it needs to propagate all the dependencies. And the yeah. deeper this chain goes, the more dependencies one view controller needs to be aware of. And it creates this like really rigid um, coupling. Some of the dependencies between like a screen and its like parent and parent screen naturally encoded in the route. But on mobile, there's the main app screen, like the main menu, so to speak, then I'm opening a list of tasks and then I go to the task, right? So the task may want to know uh, from the context of what list, like which project or what special list, such as all priority tasks all, or calendar, that might be important, but this is already an encoded in the route. So I don't need to pass this around. It's already there. Another kind of dependency is data. Let me get back to that later and kind of global functions or features like like things that are specific to the whole app. In React, there's this concept of React contexts. There's analogs to, to Swift UI. So you'll you'll you might catch it on really easily. And the point is that at what whichever point of the React component hierarchy, you can set up um, a context provider and pass it some value. So this provider has a name or rather an object that describes this particular um, context and you pass a value 
to this provider. And then nested underneath that context provider is you know more tree of components. And in any um, descendant of the provider, you can fetch the value of the context. Passing things around deeply, like access to the database, access to the notifications manager, or whichever object um, gives you access to the API, or um, schedules uploading of files. In our app, um, you will set that up somewhere in the root component, and you will propagate it throughout all of the components using contexts. So this is um, this is not explicit, so there's no boilerplate around that, but uh, it's not a global, it's not a singleton. It is passed through the hierarchy. So if you change it, if you change it up, or you, if you want to um, switch it to a different provider with like a mock for testing or something like that, uh, you can do that really easily. You described a pretty good architecture that enables you from get go to have testing. And we all know how hard it is to test a view controller because you need to set up so many things around it. How do you guys uh, do testing um, of screens, components, it must be. I'll be honest with you, we don't. That's the moment of, of disappointment for you. I, I can I can see that. I've I've not been convinced of the of the trade-off there. End-to-end -end testing on the other hand is a total pain the, in the butt. It just it's so fragile. It's so easy to break it. You have to worry about it all the time and it's really slow. And when you have three platforms, you have three end-to-end -end testing uh, targets. We iterate over pull requests very quickly. We have small, short, very reviewable pull requests. Uh, whenever CI turns green, we merge it. We use it ourselves in dog footing for a week and then we ship it. We've tried end-to-end -end testing and it's it's one of those things that yeah we'll we'll get back to it but it's it's hard to make it work all of our custom infrastructure is very well tested all of the things to which you can um write unit tests um we do that our constraints are also a little bit different because it is a product that we use all the freaking time like our our whole work is based on this product we have a very serious dog fooding philosophy. We have auto updaters. If you open the web app, you always get the newest version. If there's a new comet, if something is merged to master, you get the new version. If there's a new comet to master, CI builds the iOS app, the Android app. Once that gets built, you open the app, it tells you you need to update. You can't use it. Right. This is the old version. So basically yeah. you have a unit test level kind of coverage and then your end-to-end -end testing is essentially your dog footing right yes what would be the reason that would push you for testing if something is really important then you want to test it more if something is easy to test you want to test it more and if you have a thing that if it breaks you won't notice then you want to test it on the other hand if something is really hard to test and if it breaks you'll see it immediately because you use the app then maybe that's this thing is not something that that you should test. Yeah. So I, I'm I'm thinking of it in terms of weighing these these two um, values. I'd say if something is really hard to test, you you might want to look into like maybe rearchitecting it in a way that it's it's easier to test. Some things are inherently easier to test. A pure function is inherently easier to test than testing the whole system end to end. What is a pure function? If the input always yields the same output and there's no side effects, that's a pure function. So yeah, whatever you can make into a pure function, make it a pure function. First of all, it's easier to read. It's it's just like once you learn this this style of um, programming, it, it feels obviously better and it's testable. So the area that is harder to test is smaller. So I want to kind of get back to, to the point where you kind of mentioned that, okay, cool, the app is in React Native. Mm -hmm. uh, but it does have points of integration with iOS and macOS. Let's say uh, Apple announces a new feature, right? What yeah. is it like for you to integrate with the new feature? Because as you explained, you know, it, it's not, once you commit to React Native, you don't get too many things for free. It's not that Apple keeps updating UI kits, you know, behind yeah. the scenes. So you don't get that. What is this process for Nosby? So there's three sorts of new things that Apple would announce. One is an app extension. 
that will be completely native. Another kind of thing is an API, something that doesn't have user interface, call some function, maybe it brings up some of its own system UI. Let's say we wanna add a feature where you speak to the phone and it saves both the audio and the transcribed text offline. That's really easy to do, right? Um, it's just Swift code with <laughs> weird Objective-C magic macros that, um, that make this available from, from JavaScript. Um, the third kind of thing would be some sort of system UI that you'd want to use. Um, let's say, let's imagine there's a new date picker, like a calendar or something, totally hypothetical example. Um, that's also not too difficult to do. Um, there's a there's a different sort of abstraction for bridging that. React Native, for those unfamiliar, it's not a web view. Um, the JavaScript drives the app, but the UI is completely native. Uh, it's 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 just UI kit. So you make a view manager. That's what it's called, and you just hook the two things up. That 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 tends to be pretty straightforward. There's a few sort of sorts of things that would be tricky. Um, if you have some native UI that doesn't um, that doesn't have a, a size that's known ahead of time that you know has some intrinsic size that you don't know, then that's tricky for complicated architectural React Native reasons. So far for app, for our app, this has happened zero times. Um, we we just didn't have this problem. Another kind of native work that we do in the app is on the infrastructure level. So um, for example, I've committed to React Native uh, support for Mac Catalyst. We don't use that yet, um, but I've I've made it compile for Mac Catalyst. I've done work towards uh, making the UI scene um, sets of APIs work better, um, so that it's it's really easy to have multiple roots for React Native with the same JavaScript bridge orchestrating that. There's also some really complicated pieces of built-in uh, native UI integrations. So for example, UI scroll view is a really complicated piece of machinery. And then mapping that onto the React style of thinking is a real, really complicated piece of machinery. Uh, can you talk a bit more about uh, performance, right? Let's say I'm noticing that yes. my app is sluggish. Uh, what is React Native way of debugging performance issues? There's a few things that can be problematic in terms of performance on React Native. One that is almost never an issue and surprisingly often is with like pure native apps is um, frames per second. In kind of standard traditional iOS development, the vast majority of work that you do happens on main thread. So both the logic and UI lives on main thread. If something blocks main thread, no scrolling for you. In React Native, almost nothing happens on main thread. Main thread is like UI kit only. JavaScript lives in its own thread. There's some other React Native magic for um, calculating layout that lives in its own thread. Um, most of the native integrations or many of the native integrations that do serious work. Um, also, um, there's a very simple API to like make it work on its own, you know, GCDQ. Everything is almost always battery smooth in terms of scrolling, uh, but sometimes you tap on something and it doesn't react immediately. Um, or your your JavaScript is completely broken and so everything highlights and scrolls, but nothing works. On Android though, uh, if you're not on top of the line device, uh, it can get sluggish. That That is, that is a problem. Um, the solution to that, uh, for me, for us, you just have to be much more careful about just fundamentals you know, just, just programming fundamentals. Um, why does something take time? Because it does too much work. In Swift, um, you can often get away with doing things on a, with very like weird, fancy abstractions that, that try to be really cool, even though they're really inefficient, but, but it just gets hidden away in, in the noise. Um, in JavaScript, running on the device, especially that it has no just-in-time compilation, it's interpreted. Um, you have to be like straight to the point. You, uh, when you tap on something, you have to do something immediately. Um, when you render lists, they're very virtualized in React terminology in the sense that pretty much only what you see right now gets rendered and then stuff below the fold gets rendered incrementally or as you scroll because that takes time. As for debugging, um, to be honest, React Native doesn't have 
the best tools uh, built in. Um, some of that I, I've, I've been working myself to, to build better tools. So um, one thing I, I did recently was, um, I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Speedscope. Speedscope is the best um, tool for viewing time profiles that I've ever seen. Um, and it, it imports from like instruments and from Chrome web tools, from you know all the languages. You import it into Speedscope because it's a great viewer of time profiles. I've added a patch to so that it can import stuff from Safari Web Inspector, which means that I can connect to my device's uh, JS context, take a snapshot, put it in Speedscope, and then I see what's happening on the JavaScript thread. There's a layer of abstraction in the React Native world called GSI, JavaScript uh, Interface, and I've been doing some magic with um, how it interacts with JavaScript core to avoid some of JavaScript cores. Uh, JavaScript core has a really bad API, um, and it creates performance issues that have nothing to do with uh, how slow is JavaScript and just everything to do with JavaScript core, and I've been working around that. It's not JavaScript core problem per se, but with any sort of... Um cross-platform technologies, you end up having this problem when if you cross the threshold between two technologies way too often, that's where you pay the cost. Yes, right, so exactly. What is your approach to kind of avoid that? Do you have to, like in the app, do you even have to deal with that too often? Or is it kind of like 90% of the time you write JavaScript? Much of that does have to do with, with JavaScript core. Uh, so React Native, you can also back it with V8 or with uh, Hermes. So this is Facebook's um, JavaScript VM. And Bridging is much cheaper there. It's easy to get into the mindset that components are free, uh, free abstraction. But if they render a UI view, they're not. And some of that is due to bridging. There's just like, you, you make a view that's really complicated and a lot of data gets passed through. Another thing that's um, maybe not super unusual, but I guess minority um, about Nosby Teams is that it's an offline first synchronized app. So most apps have to, you know, just, just fetch data as you open it through REST or GraphQL and then you, and that's the, the biggest performance bottleneck. So you think about caching and stuff like that. Um, none of that is the case with Nosby Teams. Um, this app is synchronized. You have the full local copy of all your active stuff, all your project tasks, comments. Uh, downside to this approach is the, uh, on a plugin, there's a lot of stuff to download. But um, first of all, it works offline. Second of all, it's really fast because when you tap on anything, it's already there. Third of all, you have um, huge control over reshuffling data. You go to projects, every project has tasks and tasks have comments, but you can also see all tasks from all projects that are marked as priority or are in incoming, which means you have to do something about this task or have new comments or are assigned to a person or are in calendar because they have a due date at this specific date. All of this reshuffling does not require refetching anything because I already have it. I can then filter, filter it, sort it, group it. It's very easy. All of the views in the app are built in terms of the data. I built this framework for reactive, synchronizable cross-platform database handling. It's called WatermelonDB. It's open source. It solves a few problems. First of all, it has all the capabilities for synchronization. With um, synchronization, you have to think about conflict handling, like what if two people change a task, for example, or a, you know, a project. You have to think about all the edge cases, consistency, uh, reliability, error handling. If you want to push something from the app with a REST approach and it breaks, then you just didn't upload it. But you can't get into, get into a situation where pushing in sync your changes is permanently broken and you have to log out and in again, or some of your data is lost. That's unacceptable. Cross-platform between web and um, Android iOS is really hard. So you know the abstraction for that. And the react reactivity is a really cool um, thing. So when you build a component, say a task or a list or a comment, then it observes um, either a record or a query. For a record, 
it's simple. If the record changes, the component re-renders. With um, queries, it feels even more magical. You're looking at the screen of all parity tasks. And you don't have to think when you're developing a parity list, um, a parity task list, you don't have to think about where this data comes from and how it can change and what can change it and when I have to re-render it to, to update its state. Um, it just observes a query. You know, in a different place of the app, I can end this task or rename it or remove it from priority. I can drag and drop it to, to reorder it. And I can do all of that on another device while, while both apps synchronize with each other. I just don't have to think about it because the framework abstraction knows that this query changed. Here's the new stuff. Also, there's the React abstraction. It just specifies how the component hierarchy derives from the data and what actual changes in terms of adding, removing, reorder need to be done is also abstracted away. That is very cool for just avoiding huge classes of, of bugs. It's uh, very dynamic. It, you, you don't have situations where like some data is stale. It's always up to date. Conflict resolution is notoriously hard, as you just mm -hmm. mentioned. Um, who is considered to be source of truth mm -hmm. and how much of conflict resolution logic lives on the client? The backend is the source of truth. It always is. Um, clients have a copy of the data, but it's a constrained copy. All of this stuff is shared mostly. Some of it, it might be in a private project or it might be shared with someone. And like there's parts of the graph that you don't see. Also records have properties that are um, public. So everyone sees this record as the same and also have private properties. So for example, a task might be priority or not, but it's a private property. So another person in your team sees the same record, but it has a different value. As for conflict resolution, um, it is done by the client. If I open the app or some like whatever triggers sync, and there's many triggers, I will ask the server to give me the diff of the state that I should see since this timestamp. The timestamp being the last timestamp that the server returned from me. And the server will tell me all of the new records, updated records, and deleted records. And I will apply these changes on the client. If it's updated re remotely, but also applied locally, then I will perform conflict resolution on device. Once applied, then I will have um, local changes that are unsynchronized. So the second phase is pushing. And then I will push to the server all the changes that I have. Uh, it's possible that between pull and push, there will be change to something I'm pushing. And then uh, server will tell me, nope, this changed. I will pull again, apply changes again, push again. So the role of the server, it makes sure that all the invariants are, you know, stay true. So if, if there's some combination of properties or relations between objects that are illegal, uh, then the server won't allow it. But the difference in the philosophy of designing a REST style API and a sync style API is that if you give invalid data to the REST API, you expect it to fail. If you're pushing data to a sync API, you expect it to never fail. It cannot fail because if it fails, then you can never again sync because you have some unsynced state that is considered illegal and you must be able to push it. So server will take it and will sanitize it into a state that is legal, but will mark it as a change. And so next time you ask the server for changes, you will get a new version of this record or the set of records, or it will ask you to delete something that shouldn't be there. At the point where you successfully pull from server without any conflicts and without any local changes, you're guaranteed to be in a consistent state. Maybe we can talk a bit more about the kind of networking side of the story. Right now, Sync gets triggered when I make any local change. So I make any change and after some debounce you know, time, I will sync. If I open the app, I will sync. If I close the app, I will sync. Um, Every once in a while, I will sync. In the old app, what we had is um, we had a, a WebSocket 
and the server could tell us, hey, you should sync now, and then we'd sync. So we'll do the same eventually, um, but and it will make it better. But honestly, you only you only see this inconsistency if you're actually looking at two apps side by side while having it open. So I can imagine the case when if you are in a shared folder and uh, the owner, let's say, just removed it. So like there can be potentially some sort of lag between you continue to make changes to that. And then <laughs> once you learn that it's been removed, you kind of like all the changes are lost or something like that. This task will be, you know, will be recreated just for you so that you're aware that something you didn't expect happened and you can deal with it whatever way you want. But it doesn't actually happen. Let's say I want to create a task between us two and use it just as a messenger thread, right? Like mm -hmm. I just want to use use it for the comments. Is it real time? Is it uh, I'm just falling for for the changes? Mm -hmm. In terms of philosophy and an approach to like the problem that the app is solving, um, real time is really not not a feature. It's possible that that we'll get back to it. That you know there are these rare use cases when you know that someone is looking at it because maybe you're talking over another channel maybe you're you're organizing the project together but it won't be a specific feature just for comments like that's kind of the 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 magic of this approach that it's a generalized system so you'll get the full sync what is the uh underlying storage are you committed to one type of storage or does mm -hmm. it does your framework support multiple and why did you go with the one that you what i'm LNDB has a layer of abstraction called adapters um, so it defines, you know, stuff like find, query, um, execute, um, batch. So all the all the writes, uh, updates, adding, deleting. There may be and there are multiple adapters for it. What we use on iOS and Android uh, is SQLite. We did think about Realm, thanks to the architecture and what is to be level of abstraction. We could do that. And maybe we will do that if we, we test and say, okay, Realm is, is faster. It's just faster. There's a very comprehensive test suite that's on the level of abstraction of an adapter. And all adapters just run these tests. So it's easy to support multiple. On the web, it's a difficult story because web uh, has no good API for storing and querying uh, large amounts of relational relational data. What we do is kind of terrible, uh, but it works, um, which is that we use IndexedDB as a dumb storage place. And then there's this really nice um, JavaScript in-memory database called Locky.js, um, which is really fast at querying, essentially. At launch, we load all the stuff into memory and then Locky.js does the shuffling around of, of this data for querying. And, then, and if anything changes, there's like some magic that I built so that only the chunks that change are actually stored in the IndexedDB. It's not something that's like great. It just, it works, it's fine. Yeah. Um, and a lot of work um, has been put into uh, this, this story so that it works as well as it does. The app with my account, which is one of the largest accounts of any accounts in NSB Teams, uh, launches in one second. You know, runtime performance is is good since it's already in memory and on desktop, JavaScript is plenty fast. Let's say you want to support uh, dark mode. Let's say that React Native doesn't support it. How would you go about doing some some sort of support work like that? Uh, dark mode is actually something that that we've we've added relatively recently, and it's been really tricky. But that has to do not with you know iOS as much as the the philosophy of the app that it's you know, the vast majority of the code is shared between three platforms. On the web, you have a dark mode. On iOS, on Android, you also have dark mode, but they work in different ways. And like, CSS is very different uh, from styling in React Native, which maps to uh, yet another technology, you know, on iOS and on Android. So it took us a while to, to figure that one out in a way that would be satisfying. Um, one thing that really helped us is um, our, st our style sheets. We use very few literals in code. We have a palette. So we have a palette and there's a palette of colors, a palette of sizes, et cetera, et cetera. So we already had the advantage that in concrete styles for concrete views, we wouldn't say, oh, the background color is, you know, 
hash something, um, we we would use our own colors, not like iOS built-in colors, but they already been named. So that was a huge help. Um, and then we thought about okay, how to how to do it since we haven't done it from the start, which we should have, but we didn't. Um, and we made some cool abstractions and um, uh, compiler level magic. So um, we're really into, you know, in JavaScript, uh, the JavaScript you write is really the JavaScript you run. There's this whole um, piece of infrastructure called Babel, and Babel transforms JavaScript into JavaScript. And um, I'm really into writing, um, you know, um, uh, AST transforms because it's a really powerful tool. You can make abstractions which are zero cost. They don't have a runtime. You have syntax that's really nice, that's really clean, that's cross-platform, but actually gets compiled into like code that's quote-unquote native to a specific platform. Uh, so we also did that with um, CSS transformations. So in CSS, we do you know, add theme and here's the name of the of the palette color. But what it will actually do is it will create this basic style for light mode and then another one for this, you know, class that's inside HTML with data theme dark, um, which can be, which, you know, we do it this way because you have a media query for, uh, for dark mode, but people are picky and sometimes they always want to have dark mode. So we control that program programmatically and listen to the media query or allow the user to, um, you know, set it so that to override it. And then on native, what can you do? Well, you can use a React Native feature for platform colors, and then um, our our palette of colors it gets it gets um, parsed, and we spit out we generate um, a Swift file with all the colors like UI colors. We generate. Um, you know, um, Apple XMLs for colored, uh, for, for named colors in, in the asset catalog, similar thing on Android. So, you know, for one file, we generate files for, um, for, for, for all the platforms, right? So then you can use platform colors to pick the color. Um, that's not exactly what we've actually done. That's a complicated story, but that would be the best description of the, the right way to, to approach it and what will probably be done in the near future. With the complication being that um, you want the dark mode to be controllable per app. Just to scare people even further, you, mm -hmm. you are a React Native developer. What does your ID slash development process look like? The vast majority of my work happens in VS Code. VS Code is the best editor that there is. Um, that's just that's just a fact. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I've just I, I've we've we've lost the remaining five percent of the audience. <laughs> yeah, like those two people that were still with us. <laughs> <laughs> no, but 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 really, um, I mean, I I always I always laugh about this on Twitter, but it just fast it 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 genuinely fascinates me. VS Code is a web app. It's a it's an Electron view, and it's a web app. And there's this Xcode thing, which is like made by the by the vendor. It's native, and like which one is fast and powerful, and which one is slow and constrained. Xcode is not a great editor. It has a really poor extension community. So it's, it's not as good at quickly manipulating text as VS Code, and it's not as fast. Um, so most of my work is JavaScript work, it happens in VS Code, and I'll have either an iOS simulator or a web browser on my side. Um, if something is like architecture level, then I mostly will work with a web browser because it has a better like debugging experience, just better ecosystem of tools. Um, then the second choice will be iOS simulator if it's something native. Um, in general, or something else specific, and then only occasionally I will look at the Android emulator. But I will have Xcode running in the background for like running the app or you know Swift work, 
it's mostly when I'm just hooking up some native feature, but it's really quick. Or if I'm working on React Native infrastructure, like you know, um, Objective C, C plus plus level stuff. In the JavaScript community, you just have great tooling stack. You have Slint for linting, and it it's much more advanced. It's it's just much more integrated. We have Swift Lint, but eh, it's 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 just it's not quite there yet. At least last time I I checked. Prettier it's like if you try once the lifestyle where the machine formats the code for you, and you will reject the notions of of artisanal hand, um, you know, hand tabulated and hand white spaced code. You will see that it's just superior in nearly every way. And um, we use types. So we use flow instead of TypeScript, don't ask why. Uh, but yes, the vast majority of the code is type safe and type checked and it's part of the you know CI flow also. Yeah, I gotta say, um, as far as the IDs, so I think that Xcode has superior performance tools. IntelliJ has superior refactoring. It's kind of funny mm -hmm. that like, I yes. heard the joke that they wrote Kotlin as a language with ID in mind. And then the yeah, VS Code is like really powerful when it comes to just um, maybe everything else. No, I think it's too broad of a claim. Any points that we missed that you think are worth highlighting as far as Nosby, like interesting kind of developing practices or topics? I think one thing that I will mention is um, the the amount of work that, that was put into building the infrastructure that allows us to share between web and React Native. Um, so I mentioned watermelon DB, but another thing that's, that I think is really cool, I'm, I'm really proud of that one. Um, no, I, I take that back. Watermelon DB is also great. I, I love all my children. Um, but the second one is called Zax. Uh, Zax stands for Zero Abstraction Cost Styling. And um, that has to do with the fact that, you know, just like UI view and NS view are kind of similar, but also kind of very different. Um, there's also a huge difference between writing UI for the web, where, you know, you have React syntax, but you're essentially writing things against the DOM. So you have your div, your span, your, you know, what have you. And the styling is CSS. And on React Native, you have a few basic items like view, text, um, scroll view, and then whatever you supply from the native side. And then you have this syntax for uh, creating style sheets, which is in JavaScript. So it has JavaScript object, you know, it's objects. Um, the keys and val values are m inspired by CSS. So it's mostly the same names and the same values, just with JavaScript syntax, but you don't have the cascading part. You don't have selectors. You just have explicit, you know, styles or style sets that you can apply to an element. So the problem is, okay, so how do you write, you know, views and style them so that you target two different platforms? So I wanted an a, a, a nice API for defining um, views, styling them. That's both unconditional styles. Um, extra literal styles like, hey, make this exactly this color because that's the color of the project and conditional styles, I, that's what I call it. So, you know, if a task is ended, then apply this style set, stuff like that, right? So there's a nice syntax for it. It's shared, but it emits um, native code. So, and it's not a runtime, runtime abstraction, it's a compile time abstraction. So you declare Zax views, and then there's a Babel plugin for Zax, and it will transpile it directly with zero runtime, with you know just as close to the metal if you, you can say such a thing in, in JavaScript uh, as you could if you were writing like HTML and CSS, and the same for React Native. The first part of that was the, the defining components API, and we've done that for like more than a year now. And then the second part, which is defining a style sheet, which compiles both to CSS and to React Native styles. Um, I've just been finish finishing that up over the past few days. So that will get combined. So one syntax, but targets 
native code at compile time with full control over what's really happening, like no magic abstractions. Um, if something is not present on both platforms, you just define, here's the web part, here's the iOS part, Android part. I'm really sat satisfied with abstractions that have essentially zero cost because they're static abstractions. They're yeah. compiled away. You you seem like a pretty open proponent of, of React Native and kind of that sort of technology. Mm -hmm. God forbid, if you ever decide to, to stop working for Nosby, mm -hmm. uh, do you see yourself getting closer to Swift, to some sort of native technologies, or are you really happy with uh, the experience? Would you advocate for everyone else to switch to that? I've been working on Nosby teams since 2016, and I've been working with Nosby since 2012. So if I get bored with that, I'm not sure the next thing I want to be working on is a, an app that it's probably, I'm probably, if I could get bored with building apps, I'll probably want to do something, something else. Do I recommend it? Yes and no. When we started, this was the best and pretty much the only reasonable way to build one app targeting web, iOS, Android, with the potential to target macOS and Windows. That's both a business decision, like, hey, you don't write the app five times, you write it once, and then a bit because, you know, every platform is different. Um, it is an organizational decision. Uh, it is really good to have one team building the app and not five teams or even three teams building one app, but really, you know, multiple apps. It's just so much better in terms of organization, in terms of not repeating the same bugs, in terms, in terms of having the same features at the same time. It's a design decision. Like, it's either good or bad depending on your priorities and your the type of product that you have, whether the app looks mostly the same and has the same features in the same places on all platforms or not. If you're building something that's only used by one person and it's something that's like deeply tied into like native capabilities, like, you know, like you're not gonna write it in React Native. That's that's just not a good idea. Like you wanted to make it a, a an experience that's completely catered to a platform. Nosby Teams is a tool. It's supposed to feel good. It's supposed to be a good app. Like I don't want a crappy app. Uh, I, I don't want like a a weird web app that that people um, you know laugh about. But it's a tool that helps people get get things done. So it's good that you have all the features everywhere and that they're in the same place. So for that, React and React Native are great, but do not expect it to be easy, okay? It can be easy if you want a crappy app. It's really easy to make a crappy app with React Native. It's not easy to make a great app with React and React Native. If you want the end result to be good, I'm not saying perfect, like it, 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 is, it is a compromise and, and there are some problems somewhere that I wouldn't have to deal with if it was UIKit or Swift UI. Um, but for the end result to be good, you need platform experts. And you do need to redo some parts that are, you know, close enough to the platform or are, you know, really performance um, critical. You need to, re like, write that a couple of times. That's just the fact of life. And also, um, before, like, Swift, Swift UI is a huge step forward in terms of developer experience. If you pretend that the, all the problems with developer experience because it's a new technology don't exist, the developer experience of using React, the abstraction of components, of thinking of, you know, it's kind of sort of a pure function of like state to UI, having things reload immediately, not having to recompile things. Those are all really good for for developer experience. The the tooling around JavaScript is really great. So it has all sorts of developer experience um, benefits also, which Swift UI also has many of them and some other ones. So developer experience wise, it's also really good. If you accept the fact that some parts will be crappy because you'll have to work on infrastructure stuff. To sum up, if you want an app for multiple platforms, and you're, it's not going to be a basic app. Like it, it's like you're accepting the fact that it will either be meh or you'll need, you know, really good developers for each platform. Then React Native can be a, a great choice. It's a much more nuanced decision to make than just oh, you know, good apps are made in 
UIKit or SwiftUI and you know web developers that don't know anything about mobile development use React Native. It's a tool with upsides and downsides as, as any. Yeah, I guess it's important to, to keep in mind priorities of the company that builds the technologies such as SwiftUI, priorities mm -hmm. of your company, and see if the overlap uh, kind of makes sense. Are you hiring? Are you looking to hire more of you know really excellent platform developers like yourself? In fact, I am. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm right now trying to recruit both an iOS developer, and I'm also looking for a JavaScript developer. I'm Radex, R-A-D-E-X, at nosby.com. And you were remote way before it was cool, so you know how to do remote. Right. Yes, the company has been remote since 2007. We've um, never had any office, or as we like to say, we have more than 20 offices across the globe. Um, yeah, m most of us are, are in Poland, but uh, yeah, we're pretty spread out. Yeah, that's implementation details. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, thanks so much for taking the time and chatting about this pretty unique indeed. Um, thanks. Thanks a lot for inviting me.